Hello and welcome to the Alexandra Wenman Show. And this is the first of my interviews that I'm actually doing online. So this is, uh, it's so wonderful to introduce you to my guest. We've known each other for a very long time, but we haven't actually seen each other in a number of years. Mr. George Lizos, how are you this morning? So great to have you on the show. Hey Alex, it's so wonderful to be here with you. I'm so excited to be finally speaking to with you after so many years that we've known each other but haven't actually had a proper one-to-one -one conversation physically. So I know. We, we've talked online a lot, but physically we've seen each other in MBS shows, waving to each other while <laughs> dancing. <laughs> on we've sort of danced around each other all these years, haven't we? It's ridiculous. <laughs> exactly, but our paths have, have crossed many times, and I'm so excited to be here with you today. Thank you so much for, uh, for, for organizing this. Oh my God, thank you so much for being on the show, George. It's about time, it's really exciting. So just for our viewers, uh, George is an author. George has a, a fabulous book called Be The Guru. And I'm just gonna get you, George, to explain to our viewers a little bit about your journey so far. What led you onto this spiritual path, I suppose, as we like to call it, the inner journey, mm. and how you came to write that book? Okay, let's start from the beginning. Yes. <laughs> it all started here in my home island of Cyprus. So growing up, you know, light workers, we are weird people, we are weird kids. I was a weird kid myself. I spent my, my childhood just wandering through the fields and talking to the flowers and talking to the plants and staring up at the sky and wondering, what is my life purpose? Why no synchronicity here? going on here. <laughs> yeah. I was one of those weird kind of kids. <laughs> just stared up, stared up at the sky while everybody was just playing cats and dogs. And I'm like, what is the purpose of life? <laughs> so that's, that was my, the beginning of my journey, but I didn't have a conscious connection to the spirit world. I was just being this strange, shy, timid kind of kid. And because of that, because I was so different from everybody else, I was naturally bullied at school. So I spent most of my childhood feeling like an outcast, feeling like I didn't belong and being bullied as a result of it. Now, Growing up in my early teens, that's when I realized I was gay. However, remember, we're in Cyprus, a small island, small community. Mm -hmm. Gay people at the time were considered to be pedophiles. They were considered to be criminals. You wouldn't talk about it. You wouldn't even utter the word gay or homosexual. So having been bullied for so long, getting that extra label, I felt would completely destroy any chance I had to make it in life, any chance I had to be accepted. So I figured the, the only choice for me was to change myself from gay to straight, one step at a time. I was very good at following the rules and pretending to be the perfect kid for my parent, the perfect student in school, the perfect citizen in society because I so wanted to be accepted. So I'm like, okay, just another thing to add on, add on to my list. Let me change me from gay to straight. And that's when I entered the most debilitating time of my life for two years. I tried to monitor Alexandra, every single part of me that could betray my sexuality. I was monitoring the way I walked. I was monitoring the way I talked so I didn't sound in a feminine way. I started monitoring my mannerisms and I ended up being this very stuck up person that walked and talked like a robot or wouldn't talk at all, just in case mm -hmm. I triggered people to bully me even more. So two years later, when I clearly couldn't change my sexuality because I was born this way, I decided, I was 15 at a time, I decided that my only way out was to take my own life. I didn't see any other choice. But just, because, just before I, could, I actually did it, just before I took all those pills, took the first two. I had an epiphany. I had a shift in consciousness and I could finally see an answer that was always there for me, but I couldn't see because I was resisting it. Mm -hmm. And that answer was just F what society says, F what people said, and just learn to love and accept yourself. The key word is learn because mm -hmm. I didn't know how to love and accept myself. Nobody taught me how to love and accept myself. I didn't taught me how to love and accept myself. All I knew was loathing myself, was feeling unworthy, was judging myself 
But Alexandra, I had the willingness. That willingness, that was the key. I don't know who was it that brought that up, but in retrospect, thinking about it now, I believe all the answers we seek are right here. They're right here available to us. It's just our own ego, our own perception, our own resistance towards change that prevents us from seeing them. So in that dark moment in my life, when I finally release all resistance by accepting the end of my life, that moment brought up the answer that was always there. And people don't have to go through stuff like that to yeah. get the answer. They just have to surrender. They just have to accept that we're, that we're never alone and we've got spirits and unicorns and angels and source all around us constantly trying to uh, impart us with guidance to get us on the right path. Anyway, long story short, I made that decision to, um, to go on and, uh, and learn to love myself. And that's when Louise's Hayes book came up, You Can Heal Your Life. So I started reading that. Louise told me to love and accept myself. How many people have read that book and it's changed their lives? It's like the forerunner of everything, isn't it? I know so oh, many yeah. people as well that, that that book came to them at the right time. She's such an ascended soul. She's like, oh, it's like there. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And that was the, 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 that You Can Heal Your Life book was the beginning of it all because it brought me to so many other different spiritual modalities like Feng Shui, like astral projection, um, dream interpretation, meditation, manifestation. So step by step by step by step, I taught myself how to love myself and how to accept myself. And I realized that throughout my life, I had been depending on other people for love, for acceptance, for guidance and for happiness. And I managed to find all that within me mm. by releasing what other people thought about me and what other people believed about me. So that's how my book, Be the Guru, step-by-step -step guide to becoming your own spiritual teacher came up. It, was, uh, it is a step-by-step -step process of all the tools. I reverse engineered my journey and I, identify all the steps that I followed to learning to love myself and then take it a step further by becoming my own source of happiness, of support and wisdom. Not just by being happy, not just my journey to being happy, my journey of receiving my own guidance about how to take that happiness and, and make it something and follow my life purpose. George, you're such an inspiration. It's amazing. So many people go through these, these struggles and, and having to break out of sort of all of that, that expectation that society puts on us. But then I suppose, like, the question I want to ask you as well is because you had two, kind of effectively two closets to come out of, didn't you? You had the gay closet to come out of. And the spiritual. Of, and then the spiritual closet. So mm -hmm. when you were coming out of the spiritual closet, did, did you find that equally as tough a struggle or did you find that easy because you'd already done the, I guess the hardest bit was with, with, to do with your sexuality and to do with your personal identity, I suppose? Huh. That's a very good question because I actually came out of two spiritual closets. <laughs> the second one being last year in the sense that I had moved from Cyprus when I was 18 and that's how we met. Um, so I, I went to the UK, which was much easier to come out of the spiritual closet because people were more accepting of spirituality in general. So it wasn't easy coming out of the spiritual closet in the, sorry, it wasn't hard coming out of the spiritual closet in the UK. Mm. because it was, so, it was so accepting of all these, um, of what, of what we're talking about right now. Mm. Um, however, I still, it, it was hard for me coming out of a different kind of a spiritual closet. So I came out of the spiritual closet. I launched myself as a spiritual life coach. Now, the reason I chose the words life coach was because subconsciously, these were more mainstream terms mm -hmm. they were more accepted terms in my home island of cyprus so i still have this subconscious belief that if i come out as an intuitive or a psychic or an angel communicator or a unicorn communicator <laughs> <laughs> yeah some people the angels are just about there aren't they but yes. people, you talk to people about yes i see unicorns they're still a bit like hey <laughs> exactly. so being like coming out with this kind of woo-woo stuff, coming out as a, as a, as a woo-woo person I really am. 
Go to George. Yeah, I love it. Wasn't, wasn't easy because I still had my parents' voice in my head, the culture, the church, because I, I, I grew up Orthodox Christian, so I still had all that programming to let go of that was subconsciously controlling me. And even when I had come out of the spiritual closet, I was still calling myself a sort of mainstream title. And when people asked me what I did, I told them I'm a spiritual life coach. I work with, um, with certain uh, spiritual tools such as meditation and mindfulness and EFT to help people find their life purpose. Whereas in reality, I was chatting to unicorns, berries, <laughs> dragons, the elementals. I was doing astral projection. I was flying out of my body. I mean, I mean, I mean, mean, woo woo ass F. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I think it's kind of okay to, to use terms that are digestible to people. I mean, yeah. that's the same thing with, um, with my channeling because I obviously I talk to galactic light beings yeah. and stellar folk and, you know, yeah. these kind of beings and, and the elementals as well. And one of the things that I found difficult is actually putting a label on what I do. And I think that's another box to break out of in society. Like, they, it's like we're expected to have these labels, like Alexandra Wenman, holistic healer or therapist, mm. whatever it is. And then I just gave up on giving myself a label. And instead, on my website, I've put a, a Rumi quote, which says, your essence is your wealth. Because... Yeah. I don't think there is a box, George, that you can put your work into in any way. And there's no box that I can put my work into either. Like, mm -hmm. it's bespoke to every person that comes along and we have access to that whole Akashic realm, right? Mm -hmm. So there are no limits. There are no, you know, mm -hmm. you don't have to fit in a box. I guess the distinction is, A, knowing what, what your market is and trying to tell them and explain them what you do in yeah. their own language. To find your tribe and your, yeah. vibe, your vibe. However... Yeah. There's a thin line between doing that so that people understand you and doing that so that you can accept yourself mm. and you can feel good about it and you can feel worthy. Because for me, I wasn't doing it. I wasn't calling myself a spiritual life coach to teach other people what I was doing to help them understand. People could perfectly understand. My tribe could understand that I was woo. -woo. But you <laughs> were trying to protect yourself. I wasn't, I wasn't <laughs> accepting it 100%. And yeah. it was such a liberating moment. Last year, I remember, I mean, I was already running a business, a spiritual business, but last year when I could finally come out with a blog, like I'm coming out of the spiritual closet yet again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. So when, cause obviously you came, we met, we met initially online when I was um, editor of a spiritual magazine here in London. And you, I think I remember you approached me about writing some articles and then you were amazing. You, you wrote loads for us. Alex. Alex, I want to take some time to thank you at this Aww. point because you were right at the start of my spiritual journey. That was the year that I told you in, in my story before when I had the epiphany, oh my God, I'm supposed to be a spiritual teacher because that's, that's what my talent is. That's what I've been, um, I've been wanting to do my entire life. So I made the decision. So I, I, I was reading the magazine you were an editor of. So I, um, I emailed you asking if I could intern for it. And you were very uh, lovely to say, of course. So I started interning for the magazine and then I slowly started writing. I remember it was the, uh, the good news, um, what's it called? The, oh, the, the good news column. column. Yeah. yeah, the column. The good the news. Yeah. Column. And then I wrote a few more features as well. And I'm just so grateful to you for giving me the first opportunity to realize my life purpose, to start putting my message out there. And it gave me the first piece of platform that I needed to start building up my spiritual business. I then eventually went into Hay House. That, that helped having that experience in the magazine. Went into my CV, of course. Let <laughs> me get my Hay House job so I could give back to Louise Hay for all she's given me. That was my primary it's amazing purpose. that you came full circle back, you know, that you ended up writing for them when you, when you had, she had saved you all those years ago. That was amazing. Yeah, and then coming back to Cyprus, being fully myself and no longer feeling, not being accepted. So that's what happens when you trust that you're not alone. That's yeah. what happens when you trust that at any moment you have angels and guides <laughs> by your side guiding your journey, when you, when, you, when you put in some trust to your angels and surrender the resistance and surrender the belief that you have to do everything by yourself, that you have to use your ego to solve any problem and you open up yourself 
to be guided by source, by spirit, everything shifts. Yeah. And that's what allowed me to do journey and find myself in the position that I am right now. Yeah, and it's amazing. Like, I, I want to say thank you to you too, George, because the universe has an amazing way of bringing people together. And you coming along at that moment actually saved our lives as well because we needed extra help and we didn't really have the budget for it. So it was amazing. It Perfect. Was... It worked for both of us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then to see you flourish and to see you blossom afterwards so quickly, it was just magnificent. That was, it was absolutely wonderful because the articles you wrote for us were brilliant. And then, you know, you them. came along like a little light out of the blue going, let me help. But it was like, <laughs> Oh my God, little guardian angel arriving on our doorstep. So that was absolutely fantastic. I and still have those articles, Alexandra. I treasure them. Oh. <laughs> I have the original issues of the magazine. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I've still got all my copies too. I always, I often like flick through them. Yeah. It's, it's kind of sad that it's, that it's no longer with us, but you never know. Some, it might get revived, but I think we're, um, we're in such a new paradigm. So many things are shifting now and it's, I think it's, uh, one of those things where you learn a lot from the experience and then you take that experience into something new. And I, I tend to think, well, this is this YouTube channel and the things that I'm doing now are bringing all that experience and bringing it forward in a, in a, in a new and better way with a new and fresh energy. Yeah. And I also, I want to talk to you because obviously you are, you're, you're now back on Cyprus and you're running your own business yourself. You're doing it all yourself. And this is something that I'm doing now. I think there's some, um, there's a lot of inspiration in people who decide to kind of take the bull by the horns and, and launch themselves. And it's no easy feat to promote yourself in this mm. way either, is it? Especially when you're an empath and, you know, a lot of spiritual teachers out there don't know a lot about marketing and branding and all of that stuff. And, um, you know, I always felt safe behind the magazine. I could promote anyone or anything before mm. myself. And now it's like learning to put yourself Different. out there is quite daunting. So how have you found that journey, putting yourself uh, in, promoting yourself? Th thanks for asking this question because most of the spiritual advice I hear out there about launching your own business and going full-time self-employed with your spiritual work goes something along the lines of just trust in the angels, just leave your full-time job and the angels and the universe will come in and support you and bring your clients and set up your website and it's all gonna be magical and fantastic and there will be angels singing and unicorns shooting rainbows out of their horns. I don't believe that. My approach is much more grounded, it's much more gradual but equally spiritual. I believe and what my path has led me to do myself is to start with a full-time job, something that has nothing to do with spirituality or it could be related to it, just so you can pay the bills. Because when you rush into being self-employed with your spiritual business, when you don't have business skills, when you don't have a platform, when you don't have um, a steady way to support yourself, that puts so much pressure on your business to support you, that eventually stifles your creativity and it curbs the growth of your business. It's like expecting a five-year-old kid to run their own business. They, they don't have the skills to do that. So my approach has all, always been get a full-time job to pay the bills, to get that out of the way so you can focus all your creativity and all your inspiration to building that business part-time. Mm -hmm. Now, this step is very important because it shows who actually wants to have their own spiritual business or who's doing it just for the flashiness of it. Mm -hmm. Because when you're working on it part-time, what I did in the uh, three years I worked um, in, in the UK for a full-time job was every single evening and every single weekend was dedicated to working on my spiritual business. I would wake up at uh, seven in the morning, go to work nine to five. I would come home. I would work until 12 in the morning, mm. go to sleep and do it all over again. Weekends, I had no social life because mm. they were dedicated to working on my business all day long. Now, if someone isn't willing to um, put in this commitment and this work and sacrifice their evenings and their weekends to launch their spiritual business, then it's best not to start a spiritual business in the first place because it means they don't want it enough. Well, it has to be your calling, I think. And, yes. and when something's your calling, you just naturally want to eat, sleep and breathe it. Exactly. Don't you? 
Exactly. That's why this, this step is so important because it shows who's actually meant for it. Mm -hmm. And then during that time, the aim is to um, develop your spiritual skills, develop your own techniques and ideas, write books, write articles for magazines, and mm -hmm. build your platform, learn marketing skills and marketing tools and business skills that you can use to launch your stuff eventually, start coaching clients, getting testimonials. Mm -hmm. And then when you're having um, a consistent income coming in from your business, that is the time to start thinking about going self-employed. Because of that also had to be gradual. When I made the decision to leave Hay House and to branch out myself, I gave myself an entire year to just make a proper plan of what I would do, how I would do it, to ensure that I can support myself financially. Mm. And then when the time comes, that's when you fly out and that's when the angels and the universe come in to support you. Because when you show up for you, the universe has to show up for you. But if you don't show up consistently and you just take two steps forward and then 10 steps backwards, expecting the universe to do all the work for you, it's not working this way because you're telling the universe, I don't want it enough. So why would you help me enough? <laughs> you're so right. Sure. It's so true. Sure. Yeah. It's, um, it, it, the universe will conspire to support you if you are following your calling and following your passion. It was funny. It was kind of the opposite for me. Well, not the opposite, but I'm a Libra. So I'm an air sign and I'm a little bit chaos when it comes to being organized. And, mm. and I didn't actually plan my spiritual business or how I was going to bring it out. So I thought I was just going to go, well, and originally I thought I would be editor of a magazine like Marie Claire. And then it became apparent that that wasn't my remit. And then I ended up going to a spiritual magazine because nothing was resonating with me in the world of showbiz anymore. Yeah. Obviously. And um, then obviously editing prediction, I thought, well, this is it. Then I'm just going to grow this magazine. This will be my, this will be my, uh, my legacy, my purpose. This will be what I'll do. And I actually did have plans to start like a TV show or something off the back of it. But the thing about that was, it wasn't my business. It, I had no, I had no ownership of it. It wasn't mine at all. I was so passionate about the subject matter, but I didn't have the means to carry it forward yeah. because I was relying on somebody else. And, you know, when all, all that went, it was sort of like I was taken back into a normal job, like you said, exactly as you said, to do yeah. it. The universe did that for me. Yes. And I went back into freelance work. I was doing that part time. And then my clients just started coming and it was all word of mouth. It, I didn't send out e-newsletters. I didn't really promote myself. I had a website, but it all was word of mouth. And then eventually I could just step across and go full time. And then it, was the same it was a similar path. It was just... Yeah. Not conscious to plant, but the universe for you. I think because it was my passion, and I'd kind of proven my metal already. You know, in that I was eat, sleeping, and breathing it through the magazine. But I mm. realised then that it wasn't about the magazine; it was about what I had to offer. And you know, and and I'm still using all those skills, obviously, but in a different way. I'm still and more than that, you. Alex. It was your consistency because yeah. when, when something is your passion, you're so passionate about doing something then A, as you said, you don't mind working long hours yeah. and do it consistently. That's yeah. what many people in the spiritual path I see they're missing. Many light workers, they focus too much on the divine feminine mm -hmm. and, not too, and, not, and not a lot and not significant. And not actually making the steps. To on things. the divine yeah. masculine. But the word is light work. It's half feminine and half masculine by nurturing the light and not expressing it, you're not doing something. Mm. When you nurture the light, you have to work the light. And working is not just sitting in meditation and visualizing the world being in peace. It's going out there and doing the work, taking action, writing books, writing articles, going, campaigning, talking, convincing, chatting to people. I and, that's what you, and that's what yeah. we do, basically. Yeah. George, I love you. You're awesome, mate. I mean, I, there's so much, like, <laughs> Honestly, you've got it's wonderful. I feel like it, we're like little bookends here. The universe has kind of done the same plan for us, but from the kind of like perspectives, the spectrum. It's amazing. What what I want to know from you. Let's talk about your magical side now. Let's talk about the magical let's bring side. It on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let's bring it all back to. So obviously, you are connected multi-dimensionally to everything, and you've had 
awakening after awakening, but you have a particular connection to yeah. these unicorn energy. So how did you first discover your connection to the unicorns? Okay, so my connection was to the elementals in general, including the unicorns. But as a kid, as I told you in the beginning, I was always attracted to nature and I was always communicating with nature. And actually, when I didn't have any friends growing up because I was bullied, I would just escape my house and I was just, I would run to a tree, an acacia tree, like um, a kilometer away from I my love house. The acacia. Yes, yeah. I love the acacia tree. Cool. And I would spend my time there and I realized subconsciously that I would leave that acacia tree and I would feel good. I would feel peaceful. I would feel um, in tune with myself and no longer feel, feel sad after being bullied. So that's how I started developing my connection to the elementals, which I have a, a passion in connecting to. And so eventually growing up and when I realized my spiritual skills, I consciously started connecting to the elementals. And the reason, as you said, we're connected multidimensionally to everything. However, I believe that because we're human, because we live in this physical time-space reality, A, we're not just love and light, we're love and light expressed in physical form, so we owe it to ourselves to connect to the spirits that are here on Earth. Mm -hmm. I don't consciously choose to connect outside of the planet Earth, although I know it's possible, because I have so much love and respect for our planet mm -hmm. and for all the spirits within our planet, and specifically the elementals. Mm -hmm. The elementals of fire, the dragons, of earth, the gnomes, of air, the sylphs, of water, the mermaids, and spirit, the unicorns. Mm -hmm. My first connection was to the elementals, conscious connection, was actually the mermaids. <laughs> because, because I am from an island. I spend a, a big chunk of my life being disconnected from the sea. Now, let me just give you the definition of the mermaids and then I'll go into the, the, the story. I'll, I'll, I'll make it short. So mermaids are the spirits and consciousness of the oceans and of bodies of water in general. And they specialize on helping us deal with suppressed emotional baggage regarding our romantic relationships, as well as manifest a fulfilling romantic relationship. How so? If you study the mythology of mermaids through time, what you'll find out is that every single mermaid myth had to do with love, romantic love, and relationships. The first mermaid was uh, Assyrian goddess Atar Gaddis, who killed the mortal shepherd she had fallen in love with and threw herself in the sea and became a mermaid. And then story after story in so many different cultures around the world were about something tragic happening with uh, romantic relationships. And um, at the same time, in the past, in ancient times, all mermaids were very diverse. It's not the stereotypical half human, half fish body. Mm. We had kelpies, half horse, half fish. We had sulkies, half seal, half human. So many different combinations. Now, in time, this portrayal of mermaids got this very fixed portrayal of the half human, half fish we see as Ariel in The Little <laughs> Mermaid. Now, it's very interesting that because Mermaids are so related to romantic relationships. And this transition from a diverse mermaid to a fixed mermaid reflects how our own romantic relationships have changed mm -hmm. from the freedom we had in the past to the fixed rules we have at the present time. There are rules about what to do on the first, on the second, and the third dates what to say, how to say, what makes successful relationship, how you can be yourself in a relationship, how many partners you can have, all those stereotypical... Oh, and um, dating, right? You've got to choose in three minutes or something. <laughs> yeah, like... like That's till, quite right. Make a split-second decision. Like, yeah. till death was part. Who, oh, said, no. who said so? No. Well, why, not, why not till it's fun? <laughs> that, my wedding vows to my husband are actually for as long as our love shall last. Yes. Mm. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. So yeah. by working with the energy of water and the mermaids and transforming our understanding of what mermaids are and finding this diversity of them through us, that's when we shift our perception towards relationship and we partner with the elementals of water to find love. Now, why does mer how do we relate mermaids to, to romantic relationships? 
we feel so comfortable expressing our emotions and being vulnerable around romantic relationships when we're near the sea. And we've done that. I mean, think about all your experiences you have in the sea. We've just mm -hmm. reminisced in the past, past relationships. We see movies, couples getting married near the sea and holding hands and all that. So we've shared so much with the sea over the years that we've trained the elementals and the energy of the sea to specialize on that matter because we've given them so many case studies. Mm. At the same time, the vibration of water is, water is unstable and fluid in the same sense that our emotions are unstable and fluid. The sea is deep and vast in the same way that our, our, our unconscious emotions are deep and vast throughout the romantic relationships. So it mirrors each other. And that's how we've labeled the energy and the spirit of the sea as mermaids. We've created stories around them, and then we can partner with them to help us heal our romantic relationships. Okay, that was a long story. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think also um, it, it reminds me of, um, you know, talking about learning to love yourself, how you were talking about that in the beginning. A lot of people don't learn to love themselves until they've realized that they can't find romantic love until they love themselves. And that was kind of my original journey was that I got my heart broken quite a few times. Mm. And on the final time that was a, a horrific one, that was a bit of a wake up call for me. I've got such an affinity with the mermaids, by the way. So I yes. completely, mermaid here, um, <laughs> completely concur. And it's so funny. Like I think that learning, learning to love ourselves and, and bring, I say to people, bring yourself back to treat yourself romantically, take yourself on romantic holidays, take yourself, you know, to the sea. And one of the thing, one of my favorite things to help people love and nurture themselves is to have a salt bath to emulate the sea and to, to actually a come salt in. bath. Yes. Yeah, salt bath. And I grew up by the sea as well, so completely like understand that that is the place that I used to go to to connect with myself and to connect with my heart and to soothe my emotions. And the other thing about it is it's the unpredictability of it, isn't it? It's not always calm. It can sometimes be choppy. And you've got to love even those choppy times. Your relationship with uncertainty has to be a healthy one. Otherwise, yeah. Yeah. the quality of your life won't because life is uncertain. Yeah. But it's so interesting you mentioned that about loving yourself because it is true that um, the degree to which someone loves you depends on the degree to which you love yourself. Yeah. And I see relationships, romantic relationships, as having, or any relationships, as having as three different, having three different levels. Two are unhealthy, one is healthy. Yeah. So a relationship can be codependent, yeah. where your love depends on the other person giving love to you. Your love towards yourself depends on that. So you need the other person to complete you. This twin flame idea that, oh, we are mm -hmm. a soul. Half There's so much misconception out there about twin flames. I think no, no one really knows exactly what the whole twin flame yes. is about. I think but, it's very misconstrued. Yes, and people have different uh, beliefs about it, different yeah, understandings totally. of it. Like, the idea of like codependency yeah. is an unhealthy way of being in a relationship. Then you can go on to the other extreme, which is independency, whereas you feel like I'm totally fine by myself, I don't need someone in my life but deep down you crave for that connection with the other person so that's when you keep people apart because you don't want to be hurt and that usually happens after you're codependent mm -hmm. and you break your heart that you close up yeah. and then this healthy relationship is a self-dependent relationship whereas you understand you're whole by yourself to love yourself fully you don't need someone to fulfill you but you want someone to come in and share your fulfillment and that's the journey that you, Alexandra, have been through by working with the mermaids. And that's the journey that everybody can go through yeah. by connecting with the mermaids. I mean, we don't, we, we don't allow ourselves to be supported by nature. Mm. There's so much wisdom, mm. so much wisdom in nature. Mm. And we just see it very superficially. And we, 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 we talk about mermaids and unicorns and fairies in a fun, flashy, funny way, which is fine if you know that there is a substance to them and it's not just something we used to brand ourselves. It's actually life-changing, working with unicorns, working with mermaids, working with fairies. Mm. 
But we have to remember as well, like the king, the elemental kingdom works on an entirely different set of rules to the yeah. 3D. So it, it's not always light and fluffy. It's a bit like angels no. too. If you're not being authentic or true to yourself, you will get a boot in the backside and be kicked onto your part. The fairies well, can be quite mischievous if you... Don't I know that. <laughs> yeah. Don't I know that. I, I'm going to give you the story of how I stopped drinking red wine. Okay. <laughs> When did you stop, George? <laughs> that was the same time that we met. The first time we've met, I was my third year at university. And just like most university students, I would go out every single week and just get smashed and like get drunk. And I got them a clear message from the fairies specifically, the, uh, the earth fairies, the earth elementals who have to do with our relationship with our body and the physicality in the world. And the message was clear, just stop drinking. At least stop getting drunk every single weekend. And every single weekend I would just go out and get drunk and then I would feel guilty about it. And then I would promise myself I'll start from Monday and then I wouldn't do it until Alexandra. One night my, my cousin came to visit. We were supposed to go out, we got drunk clearly. And then she was straightening her hair with a hair straightener. She placed it on the floor and I stepped in it barefoot. Oh. So I burnt my foot <laughs> and for a month afterwards, I had a huge blister on my foot that got infected that had me limping for a month. Well, the fairies gave me a big enough sign to quit drinking and quit getting drunk and that was it. <laughs> All about your earth connection, oh my God. Don't, don't mess up with the elementals, people. <laughs> Do not mess with them. I had a major experience. It was like a major initiation. It must have been around 2012, I think, yeah. 2012, 2013. It was around the time either just before or after the magazine collapsed out from yes. us. It was like a warning from the universe. And mm. it was like a, you know, people talk about a baptism of fire. Mine was actually physical wow. fire. I was in Spain with my husband and we got woken up at six o'clock in the morning by someone shouting, have you seen the fire? Mm. and this huge bushfire raging down the hill towards our apartment. It was his parents' apartment. We spent the whole day trying to save the apartment. Now, this is where they're working with the elementals. Don't, you know, you need to know what you're doing or you need to understand that it's a very subtle energy and uh, if you overstep the mark with it, you can really throw things out of kilter. So this fire is raging towards us and I'm just calling for help. So I called on the help of the water elementals to mm. come and put out the fire. But I was like, this is a big fire. We're going to need a deluge. And I was picturing like the planes coming in, dumping water on the fire. Right. Mm. And the whole area was up in flames. It was the Costa del Sol. So they, they couldn't get water, the water planes to come into each area until the exact last minute, right before the houses were about to go. So they saved all the houses, but they had to do it all at the last minute. Very few people were injured and very few houses Burnt. And we saved our whole complex because we wet the whole area and we were like bucketing water out of the bathtubs and hosing everything down. But it was all day. It went on from six o'clock in the morning until three o'clock in the afternoon. Finally, a fireman came into our complex and said, you've got to get out now because this huge tree exploded in front of my eyes. And I thought, oh my God, we're going to lose the flat. I didn't like, so I ran out. My husband made it past this much gap between the fire and the fence. He, otherwise, he would have been trapped. He just made it out. And we left and we went to the shopping center because it was the only kind of safe place to kind of go and wait for it all to calm down. And then later in the afternoon, we came back to the flat. And, uh, yeah, my, I got my deluge. Uh, the flat was flooded. The whole flat was completely flooded. And, um, but it, it gets worse. Like it was basically, we'd left the bath running unwittingly when we got evacuated. So the flat was under this much water. Luckily it had marble floors and it was just like giving it a good old. Yeah, time. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was a cleansing by fire and water. And then when we came back, when we came back to London, at the end of that time, it was also a bit trickster energy. We lost the gate button so the, it wouldn't, the flat wasn't going to let us leave. We couldn't oh get out God. the gate. We ended up get, like getting the neighbor to let us out. We got back to London and the following week, the entire area was flooded. <gasps> there, was storms, there was rain, bridges were washed away and I'm sat in front of my TV. Uh, Alexandra, what do you think the message was from the elementals? It was, 
you don't know your own power. Mm. Therefore, with what you're dealing with, do not mess with us. Originally, I think it was also a cleanse. I was going through a big awakening at the time and it was a preparation. But mm. it's also like tread carefully with these energies because I asked so many times for water, like too many times almost. You know, make your request, but trust that but it's us, heard. Don't push it. If you overstep the mark with these things, you can really... And I knew, I absolutely knew that I had something to do with that. And I, and I also believe that many of us working in these, in these energies, we've had lifetimes where we have been initiated as shaman and as, and as healers in previous lifetimes. And we're mm. reawakening to this wisdom that we already have. It's nothing new, it's, it's ancient wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I think I'd, I'd obviously tapped into some ancient aspect of myself. I didn't you know how to handle it. Yeah, I had worked with elementals and I didn't know my own power in that regard. And that, that kind of, I was like, okay, I made your respect. I was being asked to respect nature. Yeah. And, you know, since then I still work with elementals, but I'm very careful. And it is about coming back into trust. You know, make your request. I was respecting them. Yeah, for the highest good and then trust and respect. Respect. It's very, in it's yeah. very interesting, Alex, because as I told you, my, my bachelor's degree was in geography, where I studied the elementals yeah. from a scientific yeah. level as well. Yeah. You know, a weather phenomena, how beaches are formed. So I studied all the elementals. Amazing. From a very scientific perspective. And what my, my, my geography teacher always used to tell us is that it's not about saving Mother Earth, planet Earth. It's about saving the human race yeah. because planet Earth has been here for billions of years and it knows how to survive. It's got processes to flush out toxins and ensure that it maintains its balance. Yeah. Question is, will it flush us out as well? Yeah, that's Find a good way of putting balance. it, George. Yeah. Because that's how the elementals work. All these adverse weather phenomena we're seeing going in the world right now, these are the elementals mm. reacting to all the pollution we're putting out into the world. These yeah. are the elementals trying to find their balance. Mm. However, it doesn't have to be this way. If we consciously partner with them, realize they are there, respect them, reach out to them and be guided with them to help ourselves, help our human race survive. It's beautiful. They, they are talking to they, us as well. Yes, they, 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 they take a step forward and we have to take a, a, a step towards them as well to partner with them. If you learn to listen to them too, like I found, as you reach a certain level of consciousness, yeah. they will speak to you. The trees speak to me. It's oh. funny that you mentioned the case. I have trees now that grow up through, I do a, my healing system is called Precious Wisdom, which yes. all was channeled <clears throat> around the same time that all this was going on. And Precious Wisdom is a, a system that aligns you with your own divine consciousness. So exactly. it's not, I'm not doing anything when I'm giving the healing. It's not even a healing as much. It's an alchemy. It just allows more and more of your human self yeah. to align with your, with your human self. Mm. One of the byproducts of this is, first of all, gifts of psychic gifts awaken, channeling gifts awaken, all your natural uh, ancient wisdom turns on. And then I found that one of the symbols is the Kabbalistic tree of life, the, the Kabbalah tree of life, but also then that Celtic tree of life, just us as the tree of life. And recently when I've been doing it, I gave a talk on this with Gathering of Minds, recently the, the, the talk on plant consciousness. Yeah. The plants have started speaking to me, the actual trees. And what will happen is the tree spirit will grow up through my energy field and around me like a vine or a, a, a tree will actually grow within me. And then it will give me its name. I'll be able to see the leaves and the flowers and everything. And then it will tell me how it's helping me and how it's helping to heal me. And these are, some of them are trees I've never heard of before or I haven't known the full name of before, but they're actually, I've asked as well, is this tree telling me to go and take a flower essence or a herbal supplement? And I get, no, you're being given the gift of that healing already just through your consciousness. Mm -hmm. You don't need the physical supplement because you're accessing the consciousness of the tree. Good anyway, and, yeah. From like August, I was getting really bad heart palpitations. And it's obviously an ascension symptom. I haven't, there's nothing wrong. I've had tests done, but really severe heart palpitations. And I keep asking what's going on. 
And the other night, this tree grew up through my energy field, as has been happening. Acacia was one of them a couple of months ago, which is amazing. And the other night, I got this tree, and I, and I was like, oh, what's your name? And the tree said to me, I'm Belladonna. And I went, well, that's a beautiful name. Belladonna, what is Belladonna? And then it said, Deadly Nightshade. And I was like, oh my God, am I in a like Shakespeare play where they poison each other with this Belladonna? Because it is poisonous. It's a poisonous plant. But it is also a homeopathic remedy. And one of the things that Belladonna is here to help cure in very small, obviously controlled amounts is heart and lung issues. Uh And I realized that after I connected with Belladonna, my heart palpitations stopped completely and I haven't had one since. And I actually, when I Googled what the homeopathic remedy helps with, it's heart palpitation. So the, as we reach these, like, as we open and connect with the earth more through this love vibration, if you learn to listen, the elementals will speak to you. They will help you, but they will also ask you to share energy with them. So we're we're connected to all of it. Humans actually share plant DNA. So we're not separate from Gaia. We are part of her, we're born of her. So if we work exactly as you said, if we work in cooperation with her, we heal her and she heals us. It's a symbiotic love relationship. It's it's like an infinity symbol, isn't it? You you give as you receive. And what you said that we are part of the elementals, we actually are elementals ourselves. Yes, we're made up of all the elements, right? We have all the elements within us. We have water, yes. we have spirit, we have fire, we have earth, we have air. We breathe it every single day. So if we realize that we are part of the elemental kingdom, then it, first of all, it takes the woo-woo-ness away of it. George, are you saying that I'm a unicorn? <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely saying you are a unicorn. Excellent. Yes, it's true. <laughs> It is true. It allows us to like, connect to them more easily, basically. Yeah. And since you've mentioned up unicorns, I, I, I didn't answer your question. Yes, about we, we, we've come full circle. You're like me. I love you. You go off on the whole, you go around the multidimensional conversation and then you bring it home. I always do. Back to unicorns. I'm back to my original point. Yes. <laughs> yes, tell me. So talk to so, me about your connection with the unicorns. So unicorns, again, I, I, all my spiritual work, I like to combine academics and science with spirituality. So I, I back it up um, on, on both on both but sides. There's no separation, is there? I mean, it's all there's quantum. No separation. Yeah. But I like the, the connection of it, uh, the, the, um, the academic connection of and, and bringing, it, bringing in elements of that in my spiritual. Yeah. So with unicorns, when I did my research about the mythology and the history of unicorns, actually unicorn, the unicorn myth came into existence out of, out of a mistranslation of the Old Testament in the Bible. So the Old Testament, it's a really interesting story. The Old Testament in the Bible talked about an animal called Rem. And that animal was strong and powerful. And when the Greek translators tried to translate the Hebrew Old Testament to, uh, to Greek, they didn't know what Rem was. Mm-hmm. But they heard of an animal called Monogeros, which means unicorn. It's in Greek. Unique horn, right? Yes, mono, yeah, monogeros <laughs> means mono horn. one horn, one yeah. horn, literally. That was in a in a in a in a half fat half myth book written by Tesias of Cnidus, which was a Greek um, writer. But research has shown now retrospectively that what Tesias was referring to as a unicorn was a different kind of animal that wasn't a unicorn. So. Unicorns never actually existed as real life animals. But that's what the Greek translators knew, that they have, they've heard of that. So they, tra- they, they thought, I guess, Rem must be a monokeros, a unicorn. So they translated it to monokeros. And then from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, all the other translations were based on. So monokeros was translated to unicorn, one horn in English, to einhorn, and uh, in. <laughs> God, I, I speak half, um, half Spanish, half English now, um, in, <laughs> in German, yeah. and in so many different uh, languages. So the unicorn myth came into existence because it was in the Bible. So people started wondering, what is a unicorn? So the quest to finding the unicorn, this animal that was so pure, strong, powerful, but also subtle and pure and magical and that could cure any diseases with its horn and could purify everything. They tried to find this fantastical animal. And when the world was fully discovered, a 
and the unicorn was not found, it was declared as a myth. However, that's when things got interesting in the sense that people's obsession with the unicorn didn't end there. People still wanted to believe it existed, even though the world was discovered, the animals were discovered, and there was no unicorn to be found. Now, what does that mean for us right now spiritually? For thousands of years, we've been searching to find something that's perfectly balanced between masculine and feminine energy, that's strong and powerful, but also gentle and subtle, mm -hmm. that could cure all diseases, that could bring you in alignment with your source. We've been trying to find it, not realizing that it was never lost in the first place because it had always been here in our unicorn soul. So the unicorn is basically the spirit of our soul manifesting itself in the form of a unicorn. So we can communicate with our soul in a more um, palpable way to follow our light worker purpose. That's why uh, most, it's mostly light workers who have a connection mm -hmm. with their unicorn soul because it's got a balanced state of nurturing light, but then working your light. Mm. And in the same way, unicorns are part of the elemental kingdom as the elementals of spirit. Yeah. So we can access our own personal unicorn soul, mm. but we can also access um, unicorns collectively as the spirit mm. element. So they, they help us uh, bridge the physical elemental kingdom with the dimensions with the woo. <laughs> I love it. They form this blend between our physical body and our soul, our spiritual body. So they have a beautiful a connection between the two. Mm, and that's what I love. None of this is woo woo really. It's all normal and it's all accessible to everybody. And this is one of the things that um, I really want to, I, I, my, is my real intention with this channel is to normalize the conversations about these things. It's the same with the angels. The angels are not separate from us. They are us. They're the they building, us. building blocks of creation. And it's all mathematical. You know, Metatron is the consciousness of the sacred geometry that we are built on. You know, it's the unconditional love, the, the golden mean, the divine proportion that Da Vinci created so many sculptures about. Exactly. All within us. We are, the, we are the entire consciousness of everything in existence in yes. form. And, it's, and, we, and we just like labeling different stuff. Yeah. We're labels ourselves. Yeah. I mean, we're separated in different egos. So yeah. it's easier for humans to work with angels or fairies or unicorns when we give them that name, when we give them a personality and a form. Because I find that if we, I feel it's important that we work with these labels. Yeah. Because it's easier to connect to these kind of chunks of spirit, even though we are all one, and it's important to understand that. Mm -hmm. It's also important to identify different forms of oneness, different forms of like different drops um, of the same glass of water, mm -hmm. for example. So we can communicate and focus on energy towards them and get more specific guidance. Otherwise, if we're just connected to love and light all the time and not specifying, then we can take that wisdom and translate it into the people we have to teach. Absolutely. We have to be very grounded. I think there's a very common misconception with uh, spiritual groups and among spiritual people that to be spiritual means that you have to be all airy fairy and floaty and woo woo, as you say, but we're normal people. We're living normal lives and the time for being a monk sitting on a mountain and meditating for your whole that's life. I mean, that's, some people are still doing that, but that's not the only way. And that's not the only way you can actually have access to higher consciousness. That's not light work. That's light, light. There's so much, there's so much light on this planet now yeah. that you can be enlightened and go shoe shopping or go to the pub and have a glass of wine. You know, exactly. you don't have to separate it from your everyday life. You know, this is what we do, right? Eat, sleep and breathe it. You know, I'm still a normal girl. I still like doing normal yeah. things and having normal conversations, but Everything in my life is divine. Even going grocery shopping is a divine act because I cannot escape my divinity because I am divine. Your and presence is your divinity. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's, I think when you put your intention into everything you do, an intention just to be completely aligned with your highest truth and your highest light vibration, then you can't not be it. You don't have to be meditating 
or yeah. connecting consciously to be enlightened or to be divine or to be spiritual. We are spirit in matter. So yeah, we're already doing it. You know, even when you're picking your nose and wiping your bum, you're, you're divine. You yeah. can't escape it. So I absolutely agree. And there are so many people that I talk to on a daily basis where they, 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 they don't feel they are, they can commit on a spiritual practice because it sounds like so deeply spiritual having a spiritual practice. But the way I define a spiritual practice is a happiness practice. Yeah. It's something that makes you happy because happiness is who you are. Yeah. It's, not, it's not inside you. It is you. You are happy. So it's just a matter of reminding yourself that you're happy. That's what spirituality is. George, we're so on the same page. I love yeah. it. Seriously. It shouldn't be hard. I think the days of like self-flagellation are done, right? That's the old yeah. way. Alex, part of my spiritual practice, apart from meditating and doing yoga, is watching Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> yes. Because she makes me laugh. She's Why awesome. would that be less spiritual than reading A Course in Miracles? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I or love dancing it. or singing. As long yeah. as it's consistent and it's conscious and you do it for a certain period of time. Yeah. I, I feel commitment is very important. Otherwise, it's not a practice. Mm. Otherwise, you're not you're just playing. Mm. You have to, it has to be consistent, conscious, and it has to be happy. And it has to be happy and you put your intention into it. So George, tell us, are you planning another book on all this magic that, uh, Ooh, you that have something you just... your whole energy field lights up and sparks yeah. when you talk about the elementals and when you talk about this, you're so, you're so walking your talk now, you're fully in it, you're immersed in it. It's beautiful to see. So, so what, what's the next steps for you? Interesting you tapped into that because I'm actually are working on a new book. I'm not ready to, to say anything yet because okay. it's still in the early stages. Yeah. Uh, there, there is something coming for certain. Yes. Excellent. I'm so <laughs> excited to see that. And so and with your, your business now, so you 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 work from Cyprus. So do you see clients online or in person or how does how does your business work now? I work 100 percent online. This is my passion. This has always been what I wanted to do was the idea of um, was being location free, having a lifestyle that fulfills me. The sunshine and the sea definitely do. <laughs> That's why I had I'm to, have to come visit you. <laughs> and then working online. But if, if someone would like to connect with me, the best places would be A, Instagram, George Lizos, at George Lizos, where I share uh, daily stories and posts around um, spiritual tools that get your light working that is what i'm really trying to do to get light workers to yes nurture the light but then work it and put it out into the world and also my free private facebook group your spiritual toolkit which is again about providing people free spiritual tools that they can use to nurture their light and then work it into the world wonderful and your website just for our viewers is it georgelizos.com it is georgelizos.com and I actually have um, a mini gift for our viewers. Um, if you go to the link georgelizos.com forward slash lightworker dash survival dash guide, you'll get my free uh, lightworker survival guide, which deals with the top five blocks that lightworkers have that prevent them from really moving forward with their life purpose, such as I care too much about what people have to say about me, or I don't know what my life purpose is. So I interviewed so many light workers over the years, and they all told me the five blocks they have, and it's all it's like five block, five main blocks. Yeah. So in that free guide, I share with people my top tools to releasing them so we can rise up more fully and not just be the light like we've been so many lifetimes before, yeah. but do the work. Yeah. Do the work that our ancestor light workers have started and really help the earth transition into this new era we're creating together. That's wonderful. It's so great, honey. And obviously for everyone watching, I'll share all the links below um, so that you can access that from that beautiful gift from George. And my darling, I just want to say thank you so much for speaking to me today. What a wonderful, like... Oh my God, I had a blast. I could do this every single day. Yes, <laughs> really connect with you in this way. It's been amazing. I think it's the beginning of, of more to come, hey, George. So you, you must let me know when you're in London next and let's go for 
tea and um, I will hopefully get out to visit you at some point. I, I've never been to Cyprus. Oh my before. God. I'll take you to all the Aphrodite temples we have here. We oh have the- yes. Done. Done. <laughs> <laughs> we'll some divine, divine feminine connection with Aphrodite. Oh God. I, and I know that we'll have many more conversations. <laughs> I actually don't want it to end. <laughs> but I just want to say thank you to all the viewers of the Alexandra Wenman Show for watching today. And until next time... Lots of love, namaste.